Good evening, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome back. This is part two, understanding the tabernacle. If you missed part one, don't worry, we'll do a quick review. And of course, you can go back and watch these. I'm so glad they're available online, not just for those who can't be here in person, but also to, to review some things. I appreciate Pat leading those songs. Uh, like you said, if you don't make a mistake, you aren't doing something. Uh, I gave a quick reference this morning to Romans 10.11. That was meant to be Romans 2.11. With God, there's no partiality. So, happens to us all. If you remember, our question this morning was, how much do you know about the tabernacle? And what benefit is there for Christians today to gain a better understanding of this Old Testament place of worship? Well, as we started to see, the tabernacle contains many types, many shadows, all of which point to the Christian age and specifically point to the Messiah. And so as we think about Moses and the Hebrews coming out of Egypt and being given specific instructions for the tabernacle, what you need to see is God has a plan. Uh, I was talking with someone after worship this morning. I think there's a lot of Christians who look at the Old Testament and they just sort of scratch their head and say, this stuff is strange. But when you stop and examine, it's not God being weird through the Old Testament. It's God foreshadowing. And when you understand the significance and the symbols that are used here, you can see the complete picture that Jesus or the idea of salvation through God's Son, that's not a brand new concept as you open the New Testament. No, that's something God has been planning before creation, and that's something that He has hinted at, that He has shown in shadows from the very beginning. Uh, now, looking at our tabernacle again, uh, let's review some of what we talked about. Uh, of course, we have this enclosure. This is the outer wall around the courtyard, the outer court. And inside this area, this is open air. So we're still outside here, but we're within the enclosure. And you remember, there's two items in the outer court when we talk about tabernacle furnishings. First is the bronze altar, and then there next to it is the bronze laver. We talked about the bronze altar or that altar of burnt offering. This is where animals were sacrificed. And this shows us in a shadow, in a type, the significance of Christ and his sacrifice. Of course, far superior when we talk about the Lamb of God, once and for all sacrifice, not something that has to be done continually through the years and through uh, continuing sin. And then the bronze laver, that place for cleansing, that place for purification. And as we noted, the priests were required to wash before they could enter the holy place. It was absolutely required. Uh, and in fact, God said, if they try and enter without, they shall die. Uh, and we noted the, support, uh, the importance of baptism, the significance of that, that we would be washed. And that's how we avail ourselves of the sacrifice of Christ. Well, then we come into the holy place, and this wide area we noted, that's the actual tent. That's the tabernacle proper. So in this front room in the holy place, there are three items. The first, which we talked about in this morning's lesson, is the candlestick, also known as the golden lampstand, also known as the menorah. This item, which gives light, which illuminates, is a great symbol to talk about God's Word and the illumination that was brought specifically through Jesus and his role. You remember in John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. Uh, that idea of shining forward into darkness, that's what we as followers of God do. We pick up on that teaching from Christ, we faithfully obey it, and we repeat it so that others can have this same access. But there's more in this front room. There's more in the holy place where the priest had access. The next piece that we want to talk about is just here, across from the menorah. It's the table of showbread. So let's go ahead and discuss that. Uh, we read about it initially in Exodus 25, from 23 to 30. And then I've given you an additional reference here, Leviticus 24, 5 through 9. Uh, and in Leviticus 24, you see a little bit more said about the cakes of bread that were here on the table. And it shows a very important tie to all the people of Israel. Uh, 12 cakes and 12 tribes, as we'll see. But the table of showbread, uh, sometimes you'll see this spelled with an O, sometimes with an E. I've put the O because that's how New King James uh, spells this word. It is a table for bread in the holy place, that which was set in the presence of God. According to God's specific instructions, this was a table made of acacia wood, two cubits uh, long and a cubit wide, uh, a cubit and a half tall. And as with everything in the holy place, it was overlaid with gold. 
If you remember, everything in the outer court is bronze, but everything in the holy place is gold. Uh, there within God's presence. The table always held 12 loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And this bread taught about God's providing for and continually watching His people, uh, that He was their provision, He was their sustenance. You may remember what Jesus said as He lived and did His ministry here on earth. He said, my meat is to do the will of Him who sent me. Uh, he had to be about his father's business, and he found nourishment. He found his sustenance always came from obedience to the Father. That's the way we should be as followers of God. Uh, as you look to this idea, let me show you part of Leviticus 24. Uh, here in verse 5 and 6, we see those cakes of bread. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an, uh, of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. Uh, so do a little simple math there, two rows of six, that's 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there's an important point to be made here. These cakes placed on the table would eventually be eaten by Aaron's family. And this is one of many ways that God made sure that the priests were provided for, that they had what they need. Well, you remember we said this morning in the New Testament age, all Christians are priests. So in the same way that priests from the tribe of Levi could say, God is taking care of us, every Christian today should have that same confidence and to faithfully face any situation with that attitude, God will take care of us. And haven't we seen, whether it be a pandemic or whether it be disease uh, close to the family, whether it be death or loss or hardship, loss of a job, through all this, we are richly blessed. Through all this, God takes care of us. And so here, the table of showbread speaks to that special closeness, that communion with our God, that God does provide for our needs. As a point of interest here, the word showbread, it's kind of a strange word, right? Well, if you look to the Hebrew, the literal translation of this term, it is bread of faces. It's kind of a strange concept, but it's beautiful once you, once you puzzle it out. The showbread, or the bread of faces, talks about being before the Lord's face, that you're not separate from Him, that you're not out on your own, that you are there before the Lord's face. And remember, this table, it is within the holy place. It is in God's presence. And so followers of God, Christians in today's world, they need to know God is with them. You today should know God is with you. And I don't think we say it enough. God loves you. God wants what is best for you. God doesn't want to leave you alone. God will never forsake you. In fact, we have that promise in Scripture. One of the ways that we see God's love, that care, and that provision is through the idea of communion. Now, none of these are a perfect parallel, and of course, the Old Testament law doesn't have a perfect parallel to communion, but I want you to notice some points of similarity here. When we talk about communion, we're talking about being in the Lord's presence in a special way. And in fact, this is the way Jesus talked about it. If you look to the institution of the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 26, we find these words. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, I want you to notice verse 29. A lot of times we don't put the emphasis here that I believe belongs here. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What is the Father's kingdom? It is the church. It is that which Jesus promised to, to set up and establish. We see that from Matthew 16. It's that which comes in the last days according to Acts 2, uh, connected to the prophecy from Joel 2 and Isaiah 2 and so on. And so when he says, till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, we need to better appreciate the significance of the Lord's Supper. When we partake of communion, we are coming into the Lord's presence in a special way. Uh, now, yes, God is in all places. He is omnipresent. But this is our special time to be before his face. You remember showbread, bread of faces. And it is to have this closeness, to have this communion with God. One thing that may be interesting to you, the Greek word for communion is the same as the word that is often translated fellowship in the New Testament. 
To have communion with God is to have fellowship with God. And for the Jews in in the Old Testament system, in the tabernacle, the table of showbread, that's what it meant to them. That's what it showed, that they had a connection with God. They were in fellowship with Him. In fact, you'll notice all the things inside the tabernacle, all, all things inside the holy place, they speak to a good relationship and the joys and the blessings associated with a good relationship with God. And so as we partake of communion today, this is something for members of the church, those who have been added by the Lord into his kingdom, and it shows our closeness to come before God's face, to be in right fellowship with him, and to do all things according to the way that he has given us instruction. Uh, One additional note you might just put down here, uh, number six from 24 to 26, the priestly blessing. One thing included there is make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Well, God's face shining upon you, again, it's that closeness to be in fellowship with God, to have communion with God. Uh, It is the bread of faces. It is the showbread. Uh, And of course, we could also make a connection to Christ, his very identity. John 6 and verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. As we noted, the cakes on the table, they were for the family of Aaron to eat. It was one of the very many ways that God made sure his priests were taken care of. And we today should have the same confidence to say all of our needs are met by Christ. He is the bread of life, and he provides those things which are truly necessary for our survival, for our contentment, and for our lasting Christian joy. And so there we have the table of showbread in the holy place. Uh, Now, the third item, we mentioned the golden lampstand talked about the table of showbread. The third item in the front room is the altar of incense. We read about this in Exodus chapter 30. Uh, Now, I want to really stress to you, don't confuse this with the bronze altar. Uh, You need to see these are radically different pieces uh, within the tabernacle, and they have radically different lessons attached to it. Uh, Like we said, everything outside is bronze, everything inside is gold. The altar of incense is overlaid with gold. You'll also note that this is much smaller than the bronze altar. If you take the time to go through Exodus 30, uh, it is a cubit long and a cubit wide, square, just like the outer one, but much smaller. Uh, And it's not used for animal sacrifice. It's used for burning incense. And so if I can draw this contrast with you, the altar outside is about death, the bronze altar. The altar outside is about the darkness of sin, about the the necessary sacrifice, about the separation that sin brings. Well, this altar, the altar of incense, the altar inside the holy place, this is an altar of praise. This is an altar of a sweet-smelling aroma. This is the altar of a good relationship with God. And so the altar outside is an altar of sadness. The altar inside is an altar of joy. Uh, Aaron would continually have this sweet-smelling incense uh, offered before God, burning there in his presence, and this is much like the praise that we offer God. It could certainly be connected to our worship in song, but I think more specifically toward the worship, the praise that we offer through prayer, uh, that we would continually be a prayerful people, and that too as a benefit of a right relationship with our God. Uh, Let me show you a couple of verses out of the book of the Psalms. Uh, First, Psalm 69 and verse 13 But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. And then we'll pair with that Psalm 9 and verse 10. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You know, mankind looks for strength in all sorts of different sources whether it's the strength of their money, whether it's the strength of their armies, whether it's the strength of their position in the natural lay of the land, or the strength of their walls and fortified cities. But God's people have learned to look to Him as their strength, as their place of refuge, and indeed God as the one bringing their salvation, bringing their victory. And so when you think about the altar of incense and that good relationship being enjoyed between God and His people, we need to make sure that we direct our prayer to God, and that we continue to be a prayerful people. And this shows our trust in Him. We place our trust firmly in God, and we know that we will not be ashamed, that we will not be disappointed by trusting in God, that He gives us, like we said, all things that are necessary. And so we have our connection with the Lord. We have our trust with God. Uh, We mentioned all these things connecting to Christ. How is it that we can pray to the Father? 
of course, we have Jesus as our mediator, the one who makes this access possible for us. Uh, let me pair this with a very well-known verse out of the New Testament, or section of verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, now, just to say a couple of things about this section. When Paul's writing to these Christians here in Thessalonica, you'll find the last chapter, chapter 5, it does sort of become a lot of quick one-offs, a lot of short sentences or statements, a lot of quick commands that are given, and these describe instructions for God's people what men and women of the Lord should do as they're living in right fellowship and a good relationship with Him day by day. And in this section, 16 through 18, you find a really great summary. And you think, well, if the altar of incense is about a good relationship with God, what should I do when I'm in a right relationship with God? Well, you should rejoice always. Uh, we know that our joy is in the Lord. You could put this alongside Philippians 4.4. 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Uh, and it's not that you have one 24-7 prayer that you're continuing to, continuing to add on to. No, it's that we continue as a prayerful people, those who continue to put their trust in God, those who look to Him continually. And then verse 18, in everything give thanks. Uh, if you are a prayerful person and not a grateful person, your prayer isn't quite right. Uh, as every prayer should include thanksgiving. Uh, every bit of praise toward God should have our gratitude being poured out before Him. Notice the last phrase, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So you could do a good job summarizing this section and just say, what is God's will for the church? Uh, what is God's will for those who are in a right relationship with Him? And remember, that's what the altar of incense is about, a sweet-smelling aroma that is a good relationship with God. Well, it's about rejoicing. It's about being a prayerful people. It's about being a thankful people. Uh, and that was a great reminder for the priests going in to do their service, that sweet-smelling incense. Uh, it wasn't like all the death outside. It was the beauty of a good relationship with the Lord. Uh, and, of course, we know the importance of prayer in the New Testament age for the church. Passages like James 5 and verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Christians today are to pray not just continually, but to pray sincerely and to pray with power. Uh, there's a word here in this verse that we don't often use, the word avails. Uh, when we talk about availing, we're talking about gaining or, or having a benefit from some activity. But when you look to the original language, the Greek word here for avails, it speaks of having strength, having power, or having force. So you could do well to paraphrase this in a more literal, perhaps, translation and say the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man is forceful, is powerful, has great strength. Uh, and indeed, we've seen, even among our own church family, the power of prayer. And aren't we thankful to God, not just for that access, but for His continual care providing for our needs? Okay, that takes care of the three items that are in the front room. Now we get to talk about some really special pieces in this tabernacle lesson. Let's talk first about what we find in between the holy place and the holy of holies. You can see it labeled here. It is the veil. Now, of course, so much of the tabernacle provides spiritual lessons, provides this education because of separation. You know, there are only places you can go, and then there's places only the priest can go. And then beyond the veil, that's where the high priest only is allowed to enter and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. God gave very specific instructions for doing this in Leviticus 16. And so this holy of holies or most holy place behind the veil, this is the smaller inside room of the tabernacle. This is where we find the Ark of the Covenant. This is where, when you think about the tabernacle being God's dwelling place, this is where God is in, in the most specific sense, the most special sense of His dwelling, of His special presence. It's that area in the most holy place. Now, this curtain, this veil, this divider, it speaks to great separation. And the lesson, I think, throughout time, God is holy. We are weak <laughs> because of our choice to sin, to rebel against God's law, we cannot approach. We cannot have that good face-to-face, -face, close relationship with Him because we are stained 
by sin. Now, every step of this journey, talking about the items in the tabernacle, you can see the importance of Jesus. And of course, it is because of Christ accomplishing his mission. At his death, the veil in the temple, which of course was after the tabernacle, it is torn from top to bottom. The reference there, Mark 15, 38, at Christ's death, the veil is torn from top to bottom, and it shows we now have access. Christ removes the separation, showing that we can all come to the presence of God through him. And it's a great lesson because in, in Moses' day, only the high priest could go beyond that veil. But the high priest was himself sinful. Whether you're talking about Aaron or any of his successors through his line, they are sinful men, and they first have to offer sacrifice for their own sin before they can go on behalf of the people. But we have a far greater high priest. Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, He was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. Christ, our perfect high priest, enters into the holy place and provides access so that we too can come and be in the presence of God to come boldly before the throne of His grace, to have this access, the same that He talks about in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And it is by Christ, it is through His sacrifice, through His death, removing that separation, showing that we can all come to the presence of God, to be beyond the veil, to have that most important access to our Creator, to our Maker. You know, when you talk about celebrating or enjoying a good relationship with God, this is the ultimate. You know, you see bits and pieces through the sacrifice, through the labor, through the menorah, through the showbread, through the altar of incense, sure. But the most important part of the tabernacle and the last item that we're talking about here in our lesson, it is the Ark of the Covenant. There beyond the veil in the most holy place. It's talked about in Exodus 25 from 10 through 22. This is an ark made of acacia wood and, of course, it is overlaid with gold. Uh, it is two and a half cubits in length, a cubit and a half in width, and a cubit and a half in its height. This box, among other things, held a copy of the Ten Commandments. And it's kept in the Holy of Holies because it is the most sacred of all items because there is God's presence. Now, let me just pause here. There is so much that we could say about the ark. There is so much that we could tell about its history with the people of Israel and how they sometimes look to it wrongly, focusing on the ark itself rather than a good relationship with God. But let's focus on something that is unique to this item in the tabernacle. The lid on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. This is where God would appear to the high priest, according to Leviticus 16 and verse 2, on the Day of Atonement. Now, you want to talk about something special. You want to talk about something significant. This mercy seat, the lid and the top of the Ark of the Covenant, it had a cherub on either side. These are angelic beings with wings on either side facing the center. And above the two cherubs, we would see God's appearance. God allowing himself in some form to be viewable. And to have that closeness where the high priest could be before God to see whatever God allowed them to see, to have this presence, this access. Now, we've been making a lot of connections through this lesson. Here's something in the tabernacle. Here's something for us in the church age. When you talk about this special closeness before God, when you talk about this mercy seat, I think it goes above and beyond everything we've seen up to this point. Okay, let me show you part of the text. Exodus 25, look at 21 and 22. It says, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are on the ark, the testimony about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Okay, now there's one thing I really want to key in on here, and I want you to see it with me. There in verse 22, uh, where God says, I will meet with you. To meet with God, to know God, to have this closeness and this relationship with God, it is something too special, too profound to well describe with our words. 
to have this closeness, to have this access. And it's something that, that far too often Christians, I, I don't believe we contemplate it as we should. Do we have this access to know God, to meet with God? And what emphasis does the New Testament give on knowing God? Well, in this discussion, let me first show you the penalty for not knowing God, for not having this closeness, for not having this relationship with the Most High. In 2 Thessalonians 1, beginning there at verse 6, uh, we see a picture of the second coming of Christ. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Notice verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's going to be punished? Who's going to be separated when Christ returns? Well, it's those who haven't obeyed the gospel. How are they described here? Uh, what do you see pointed to in the text? It's those who do not know God. Well, the high priest, when he was allowed to enter that place, to be before the ark and before the mercy seat, it was to meet with God. And that's why the tabernacle is sometimes called the tabernacle of meeting, because he was there before the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony to meet with God, to know God and to know God's will. When we talk about being in a right relationship with God, being in good fellowship with our God, it is to know Him. And again, it's impressive to me the emphasis in the New Testament given on knowing God. Let me show you another verse here. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, this is from 2 to 4. You can see again the tie to Jesus, but notice the emphasis on knowledge that's here. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, of course, I want to give emphasis to verse 3. By this, we know that we know him. Okay, how do I have this assurance? How do I have proof of this fact that I know God? Well, it is if we keep his commandments, if we are obedient to him. And like we said, the high priest, he goes on the Day of Atonement to have God meet with him to hear this testimony, to hear what they must do, how they must obey. And so if we want a right relationship with God, if we want to know Him, we, of course, must follow His commands. Uh, one thing that's interesting here, uh, in 1 John 2, the word for know in the Greek is a form of gnosko, and it's more than just having knowledge. Uh, this is to know, to come to know, or to perceive and understand. And so when we talk about knowing God, we're talking about understanding God. We're talking about perceiving Him or having uh, a working knowledge. It's more than just being aware of God. It's that we have come to know Him because of that right relationship, because of that fellowship. Uh, you know, when you hear some of these descriptions for Old Testament heroes, David, a man after God's own heart. Abraham, a friend of God. Moses, a man God spoke to face to face. This speaks to that closeness. It speaks to that idea of those who know Him, not just that they're aware of God, but they have an understanding with God. And indeed, if we are God's people, if we are sanctified, set apart, made holy for His purposes, if we are in a right relationship because of Christ's sacrifice and our faithful obedience to the teaching of His grace, then we need to understand our God. We need to have our mind and our heart linked to God's mind and God's heart. You know what that looks like in day-to-day -day life? When a choice comes up, I don't stop and say, how does John feel about that? No, I say, how does my God feel about that? And that's how I feel. Doesn't matter. I don't stop and say, what would I like or what would be convenient or what would please my spouse or my kids or my coworkers or my friends? No, what pleases my God? How has he spoken on this matter? What is his mind? What is the testimony? that he gives to me as I meet with him, as I see his word, as I see the teaching he has provided. That's it. To say, I am one of God's people and I must do the will of God. This is how we see the church, which you remember, it's, it's not this building, it's us. This is how you see the church being like 
the tabernacle because it is about that closeness possible through Christ, that we can have this fellowship with him, that we can be his people in the truest sense of that term. Now, let me show you one more verse, and then we'll back up and we'll review our map. This is Revelation 21 and verse 3. Now, realize in the 21st chapter of Revelation, we see the new Jerusalem described. John is allowed to view this, and he's telling of it. He's recording it here. And if you want to just make a note, we have a very similar text in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, 27. But here, Revelation 21, 3, I want you to notice what's said. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. When you think about a right relationship with God, when you think about a place in the kingdom, when you think about a home in heaven, what comes to mind? If someone stopped you and they said, hey, you're, you're a Christian, what's the most beautiful idea about heaven? You know what our answer ought to be? Dwelling with God, being where our God is, having this perfect fellowship with him and him allowing us to enjoy that throughout eternity. Think about some of the well-known passages in the New Testament that point to this same idea. Matthew 25, after the parable of the talents, what are those faithful ones told? Well done, good and faithful servant. What comes next? Enter into the joy of your Lord. To have that closeness, to dwell with God. That's the entire idea. Uh, or another well-known passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says the dead in Christ will rise first, and it talks about Christ's return. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up together, we'll meet him in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. See, it's about dwelling with God. Every bit of this is about dwelling with God. When we look at the tabernacle, and then look at the temple, and then look at the church, it's all about dwelling with God. And if you remember from this morning's lesson, the word tabernacle in the Hebrew, mishkan, it means dwelling place. So when we talk about God's dwelling place, it is with us. It is with his people. Now in a select way during our time here on this earth, but after Christ's return, in the most perfect way, to dwell with God forever in heaven, and yes, the most beautiful aspect of heaven, God is there. And that's where I want to be. When you look at the tabernacle, you don't find a lot of strange, empty rituals that God did just to be confusing. You find well-planned, well-thought-out shadows and types pointing to a beautiful relationship that would be possible in the kingdom age. All this that God would bring about through His Son, the Messiah, the Lord Christ. As we talked about this morning, there is separation. Uh, you see, of course, the outer courtyard, and this is not the holy place. This is not the tabernacle proper, but it is part of that enclosure. As you come in, as you enter the enclosure, the first thing, the bronze altar, where animals were sacrificed, and we understand the symbolism here to look to our perfect sacrifice. Next to that, the bronze laver, that where you get uh, cleansed. That's where you have that sanctification to be purified. And of course, availing ourselves of the blood of Christ, we are washed in that blood in the waters of baptism. And it is after that point that we're allowed to be added by the Lord to his church, to be uh, holy before him. And in the holy place, we find the golden lampstand or the candlestick symbolizing God's word, the illumination that it brings. The table of showbread with the 12 cakes of bread to talk about God providing for his people and to have that communion with him, that closeness with God. The closeness is appreciated and celebrated at the altar of incense. It's not that sad altar of death outside. This smaller altar, this gold altar, it speaks to a good relationship. We sing songs of praise to our God and we continue as a prayerful people, so thankful for a relationship with our God and thankful that Christ has had victory over death, tearing this veil in two from top to bottom so that we have access to come before God, to be before his presence. God dwelled above the mercy seat. He allowed the high priest in the Old Testament era to see him in some form or some fashion. God allows us a home in heaven. God allows us a dwelling place at his side for all eternity. And if I can point out just one last thing before we put this map away for our purposes and for our study, I want you to appreciate the beauty of what Jesus has done for us. 
Look at this. Where's the bronze altar? Where's the laver? They are outside the holy place. Jesus left heaven. Jesus left his perfect unity with the Father and the Spirit. He left the holy place to come, to live as a man, and to die as a sacrifice. He did all this with one thing in mind. You and me coming in to dwell with God. You and me having a right relationship. You and me knowing the beauty and the joy of dwelling with God forever and in eternity in heaven. If we better understand the tabernacle, we better understand our Lord. If we better understand the Old Testament system and what we find in these types and shadows in the law of Moses, I believe we grow in our love for God. We grow in the awe and the amazement that we have towards the beauty of his plan, the divine will that you remember before the foundation of the world. God had all these things planned out, that it would be just so, and it is greatly to our benefit. God has done his work. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It is wondrous. Have you done your duty to him? Have you faithfully submitted? Have you availed yourself of that sacrifice in obedience to the gospel to be washed in the blood of Christ and to rise as a new creature, ready to serve him faithfully and ready to dwell with him for eternity? And if you're a Christian who's fallen back onto old sinful practices, you've been removed from the camp. You've been pushed out of the holy place because God cannot dwell with that. But he is rich in mercy. He longs to forgive. And we want to work alongside you. If you're somewhere online watching this lesson, if you'd like to study the Bible, if you'd like prayer, if you need to be restored, the number you can reach us at, 682-235-6677. And if you're here with us in the auditorium this evening, we invite you to come and make your need known as together we stand and sing.